I'm really interested in water governance. Um, how do institutions sort of achieve stability through rules, social orders, rights, norms, et cetera, um, including legal arrangements, uh, spatial scales, and all the social actors and non-humans um, involved in making decisions about water. Um, and a project I've been working on for about 10 years is how states actually formalize informal water practices, namely uh, rainwater harvesting. Um, and most recently, I started a kind of global comparative study on this in the United States. Most of my work has been done in Mexico. Um, and it's really fascinating in the, uh, to work in the U.S. as a sort of native of the U.S. Um, and learn all sorts of funny um, uh, stories about institutions here and how complex it really is to manage water in the U.S. Um, so I'm going to start with a story. In August 2008, Utah officials informed Mark Miller, a Salt Lake City car dealer, that his cistern, which is an underground stor uh, storage tank for rainwater, violated state law. Who owns the rain? Turns out, not you. You're actually breaking the law if you try to capture rain falling under your roof and pour it on your flower bed. A prominent Utah car dealer found that out when he tried to do something good for the environment. John Hollenhorst has the surprising story. Rebecca Nelson captures rainwater in a barrel and she pours it on her plants. We can fill up a barrel in one rainstorm, so it seems a waste to let it just fall onto the gravel. Car dealer Mark Miller wanted to do pretty much the same thing on a bigger scale. He collects rainwater on the roof of his new building, stores it in a cistern, and hopes to clean cars with it in a new water-efficient car wash. But without a valid water right, state officials say he can't legally divert rainwater. I was surprised. We thought it was our water. State officials say it's an old legal concept to protect people who do have water rights. Obviously, if you use the water upstream, it won't be there for the person to use it downstream. Utah is the second driest state in the nation. Our laws probably ought to catch up to that. So what about the little guy watering with rainwater at home? Will anybody do anything about that violation of the law? If she really does do that, then she ought to have a water right to do it. Are you going to make an issue out of that? No, we have bigger fish to fry. After months of discussion, city and state officials worked out a tentative compromise with the bigger fish, Mark Miller Toyota. And he would basically be using a Salt Lake City water right and diverting it um, under our name. Small fish are off the hook for now. The state has no plans to go after them. John Hollenhorst, Eyewitness News, Salt Lake City. State officials say the Mark Miller agreement could become a blueprint for other rainwater projects. Homeowner projects, although technically illegal, are likely to stay off the state radar screen. So <laughs> raindrops fall on your head, you probably you better can do get it as them. you want. Oh, man. Can't. <laughs> I never get tired of that video. So who owns the rain? In spotlighting the upstream conflict spawned by downspout technologies, like this rain barrel, this story points to the broader challenges associated with formalizing and governing small-scale institutions and technologies. And in recent years, governments in the US have increasingly promoted rainwater harvesting as sustainable, they call it green infrastructure, as a technique to reduce stormwater runoff in streets and conserve municipal water. And worldwide, rain catchment is very popular and an ancient practice in places like Australia, India, Japan, Mexico, Brazil, um, as a conservation technique, but also, I think, and this is the most interesting part, as a means of the direct appropriation of water, sort of immediate from the sky with no kind of uh, other institutions sitting in between you and uh, the cloud, right, until states start formalizing them. Um, and despite its popularity and potential, surprising is, surprisingly little is really understood about how rain comes to fall under state jurisdiction. In other words, how states, which are usually around the world the primary managers of water, how they institutionalize and manage highly decentralized, small-scale, diffuse technologies and practices. For example, why and how does formalization succeed and where, particularly in states like the United States that offer many different institutional avenues um, to territorialize water. So in what follows today in this presentation, I'm gonna report on initial findings from a study that examines the policy mechanism, spatial scales, and governance implications of formalizing rain catchment. 
So in this first phase of research, uh, we compiled, we meaning my graduate students and I, compiled and analyzed all harvesting legislation in the United States with the eventual goal of producing a comparative international database um, with uh, other countries where it's prevalent, namely Mexico, Australia, and India, and Brazil. Um, our results, the results from this talk, have been published just this month actually in Water International. If anyone's interested in a copy of that article, I'm glad to email you the PDF, so just come up and grab me later. From here, I'm gonna describe our research methods and database, um, and then I'll kind of identify three key trends in formalization that we looked at based on our analysis. And then to elicit a little bit more insight about why um, formalization succeeds or fails, I'm gonna briefly contrast two case studies, Texas and Colorado, and conclude with some implications about what this might mean for other countries. So in collecting data, um, we aggregated information on policies related to harvesting in the US, including 50 states and several territories. Um, policies we chose deliberately predominantly um, addressed active rainwater harvesting, um, to emphasize the legal inroads to the direct appropriation of water supply. And the difference is active on the left is har rainwater harvesting is defined as the kind of constructed, intentional um, collection and storage of rain, usually with technologies like um, filters, uh, rain catchment, uh, barrels, sometimes cisterns, often in developing countries, not so much in the US. Passive harvesting on the right is the involves landscape design that uh, encourages direct infiltration into the uh, soil. So when you see cities building bioswales, for example, which are popular in Portland, that's an example of um, passive rainwater harvesting. We focused on the active. And we sought to include all possible sites and scales of governance from municipal ordinances to state laws. Overall, 96 policies were identified, compiled, and tracked. Five of these were high-profile state laws that have since been declared dead in the water by legislative trackers. There's a lot of puns in the water world. Um, so as this figure shows, uh, harvesting policies are really found all across the state um, in places with and without substantial rainfall. Uh, 15 states and territories, 12 cities and three counties. Four states that use the Colorado water doctrine, that kind of hash uh, tag marking, um, generally characterized by strict legal interpretation of water rights, like the Utah case, have harvesting policies, including Utah. And while harvesting is prevalent in the arid Southwest, several Eastern states have enacted innovative laws and regulations. For example, Ohio allows rain catchment for potable use in contrast to most areas which restrict harvested water just for non-potable purposes. So Ohio's radical. Policies span two decades, largely from 1992 to about 2013, but for the most part, most of this legislation is uh, dated recently, implemented between about 2008 and 2012. And exceptions tend to involve rather kind of straightforward amendments to existing legislation. So one notable example is the US Virgin Islands in 2008 updated building and construction codes from 1964 to incorporate uh, rainwater harvesting. They've been doing it for a long time as a sort of alternative supplement water supply and um, they just sort of updated their books. Um, Texas was also an early adopter. The state legislature passed laws um, in the early 2000s along with a publication of the highly regarded Texas Manual on Rainwater Harvesting in 2002 and has since paved the way for municipal level legislation and has become a sort of model for other states. Um, so three main trends emerged during the analysis. This is our sort of social science analysis of, of this. First, unlike big water in aquifers and rivers, rainwater is really not governed through property rights. It's governed through the minutia of bureaucracy, codes. Within our data set, 40% of policies modified rules for residential design, construction, and plumbing, which was the clear tool of choice for regulation. Most of the policies identified in this table involve revisions to code and statutes in some way. However, the 34 instances of revisions at the top represent standalone legislation. So not only modifying existing codes, but then out going out there and creating new ones. And most policies regulate micro-level harvesting systems, those ideally suited for single-family homes. Some place, uh, policies such as Illinois, Ohio, and Oregon so go so far as to redefine plumbing and what it means and make specific provisions for acceptable design, installation, and water use in rainwater systems. Um, 
While such codes seem very tiny and technical, collectively they represent a really interesting paradigm shift in governing water supply. Um, while the bulk of the quantity of surface and groundwater in the US is governed by either the riparian or prior appropriation doctrine or some blend of both, um, rainwater falls in the domain of administrative law, which is a direct product of historical urban development. Between 1880 and 1920, which was a period of dynamic urban growth in the US, cities implemented strict plumbing and construction codes in order to protect people, um, to protect urban dwellers from disease, public health threats, the result of con, you know, poorly designed engineering systems. In effect, though, now these codes have opened the front door for government regulation of water in the home in a very different way than through property rights. Um, yet as rain is uh, um, increasingly uh, directly appropriated through downspouts and cisterns, like Mark Miller was talking about, and treated as property, like the whatever, the little man, or however they described it in the video, Harvesting is increasingly regulated through plumbing codes and not property rights. So people actually treat the resource and consider it as property even though it's not that under most state laws. We also identified the process of formalization through market-based tools, the, most, the second most popular uh, form of regulation. Policies in this category range from, you know, come in the form of rebates, tax credits, and other financial incentives, and these range from rebates of like $25 in Allen, Texas, to uh, $2,000 in Tucson, Arizona, and Sunset Valley, Texas, to, and I'm sorry this isn't on there, $4,400 in the Seattle Public Utilities District. So these are kind of increasing over time. Rebates, again, mostly target single family residences and built infrastructure as opposed to actual water itself. Um, so it's uh, sort of the only way that governments can kind of track what sort of, how water is being managed is through a kind of receipt from infrastructure. Um, choo -choo -choo. Um, and at first glance, rebates and other financial incentives re reflect this kind of broader trend towards marketization, which is um, what social scientists describe as the uh, process of creating economic and policy infrastructure for treating natural resources as a commodity. Um, and one, probably the most uh, cutting edge or, or different approach to this is in San Diego, um, which implemented a pilot rebase program, not based on water infrastructure, but quantity. How much could you actually preserve? It's almost sort of creating a um, imaginary meter for water that is unmetered. Um, effective March 1st of this year, San Diego residents are able to receive a dollar rebate for every gallon of stored rain, up to about 400 gallons. Systems must be connected to a gutter. Harvested water can only be distributed for non-potable uses. Um, in contrast to other rebates, the San Diego program signals a move toward market v valuation and initial commodification of rain itself rather than the equipment and the infrastructure. Um, what's interesting about this is that the empirical realities of uh, rebates muddle any uh, sort of straightforward understandings of marketization. So when people see price tags associated with water, they think privatization, full commodification, but this, these results sort of suggest no, that it's, it's really difficult to create. Um, there's a lot of other things that need to be um, involved in the mix when you're actually developing a market for something like this. Um, and interestingly, while harvesting encompasses a shift toward individuated responsibility um, and management of water, the private actors that are involved in this vary. You know, these are households that are not necessarily doing this motivated by profit, but perhaps you know for decreasing consumption um, or any sort of other ideological uh, values. So finally, the analysis revealed a proliferation of policies at different spatial scales. And while cities and counties have taken active roles in institutionalizing harvesting, seven states have adopted broad sweeping laws at the, at the state level. Notable highlights include the Texas legislation and state laws passed by Arizona and Oregon. Um, even in Oregon, a state with more over, overall water availability, at least in the western half, than many states in the southwest, um, the state legislature updated um, uh, building codes and permits in 2008 and 2011 um, to kind of reflect more uh, harvesting. Um, yeah, so California, Washington attempted but failed to uh, pass comprehensive statewide legislation. California had um, 
uh, not one but two state bills that failed, the Rainwater Capture Act and the Water Recycling Act. Um, meanwhile, several city governments, including major metropolitan areas in Southern California, have gone ahead and kind of led the way, changing municipal ordinances and launching success successful rebate programs. Upstate in, uh, up north in Washington State, after nine unsuccessful attempts at legislation, in 2009, the very exasperated Department of Ecology issued an interpretive policy statement that did basically what they did in Utah. They declared a water right is not necessary for rooftop harvesting, um, that they're sort of seeding rights through, I don't know, the state, um, the state level. Uh, water department, which is a direct but still kind of temporary approach to reconcile local actions with state laws. Um, so why does formalization work in some areas but not others? And to provide a more in-depth explanation for success or failure, in our article we compared two states with radically different approaches to rainwater governance, Texas and Colorado. And Colorado has really done, where are they? Oh, they're not here. Colorado um, has done really quite little. It's got some um, legislation there, SB 80 and House Bill 1129 on the right. Um, but beyond State Bill 80, um, Senate Bill 80, which limits harvesting to only well permit holders and very tiny qualities, quantities, we uncovered three additional policies tangentially related to rainwater harvesting. Um, but overall, um, it's seen as a uh, kind of test mechanism. Uh, they're implementing rainwater harvesting to see if it does actually impede on upstream prior allocated water rights. Um, so the people who are allowed to do this, it's kind of through like a test or pilot phase. And there were lots of hydrologists that um, went up before the legislature to say, hey, most of the water that falls is actually going back up into the air, and it's this is pretty extremely minutia, but you know, as we know, it's really difficult sometimes to get things passed. Um, so it's, it's, it's in a kind of pilot phase. And this has prompted some Colorado residents to nickname the rain barrel the bong of the backyard garden, a technology that was, that is mostly prohibited under law, but utilized nonetheless. And uh, Texas, in contrast, sits at the cutting edge of rainwater policy in the U.S. Governments there have passed a variety of legislation, including revisions to state water, property, health, and tax codes, um, and various city rebates. And the centerpiece of this is House Bill 3391, signed into law in June 2011, and widely considered to be one of the most far-reaching and comprehensive uh, pieces of legislation. Um, it allows potable use of rainwater and makes available a pretty extensive um, training program for local people to sort of train others how to do this. Um, so what explains such policy differences? Um, we argue that the dearth of rainwater harvesting friendly policies in Colorado largely stems from a history of strict interpretation of the prior appropriation doctrine. Um, even though other western states have modified theirs, Colorado still adheres quite closely. Um, Texas marches to a different beat. Um, it helps that the state has an extremely diverse hydrologic picture, but we also argue that because it has a diverse kind of legal geography of traditions, including some that date back to Spanish um, and Mexican when Texas was part of Mexico, um, uh, a legal tradition that includes civil law um, and a mix of riparian and prior appropriation doctrines. They've facilitated both the devolution of harvesting policy to municipal and county uh, governments, but also the facilitated the grassroot rise of programs independent of state processes. So looking forward, it remains unclear the extent to which formal regulation even, even makes a material difference. As water scholars have shown internationally, people collect and manage water in rain barrels regardless of its legal designation. Legal tools can facilitate adaptive responses to um, drought and water scarcity. But as this research suggests, some aspects of formalization are disincentives to rainwater harvesting, such as in Colorado, where strict interpretation of prior appropriation prevents any downspout diversions from upstream water rights. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, our policy inventory provides an initial baseline to compare um, rainwater harvesting countries with different legal and socioeconomic conditions. One example, probably most easily comparable to the U.S., is Australia, Federated Commonwealth, which governs right through administrative law at the state level. Rain catchment is increasingly populator, popular and even mandated in some cities, such as in new home construction. 
Um, in 2010, more than 600,000 Australian households received a government rebate or incentive for technologies like rain barrels and cisterns. Unlike the US, Australia water law incorporates principles of integrated water resources management to a greater extent, which allows greater flexibility and formalization of supply alternatives like rain harvesting. As water supply alternatives are increasingly mainstreamed, the rain barrel has become a little less renegade. Thanks.